everyone, I'm Emily Graziano, and in this installment of classic Hollywood videos that I do, I'm going to talk about one of my personal favorite actresses of all time, and unfortunately, she's kind of unknown. But to start off, before I even say her name, I'd like to draw attention to this one picture in this book that I have. Now, a majority of you probably will recognize the man in this picture. The man in this picture is Clark Gable. But I'd like to draw attention to the woman in this picture, and that woman is the topic of this video, Carol Lombard. Carol Lombard was such an amazing actress throughout the 1930s and early, early 1940s, and she is such a forgotten figure, and it makes me incredibly sad that that is the case. And most of the time, if her name is brought up, her name is brought up because she was the love of Clark Gable's life, which is a very, very important thing, I think it is. But she had a career all her own, and she was just so magnificent and wonderful. And she's a true American patriot, which I will get into later. But um, this promotional picture comes from the 1932 movie No Man of Her Own, the only movie that Clark and Carol did together in 1932, and they weren't even in a relationship together, of Clark Gable being married to his second wife still, although unhappily he still was married to Rhea Langham and had, uh, although it was an unhappy union like I mentioned, he certainly had no interest in Carol Lombard, and Carol Lombard was married to her first husband, William Powell, actress William Powell, with whom of which I also equally adore. Um, William Powell, of course, of the Thin Man series. Um, and when they made this movie, No Man of Her Own, it was the only movie they ended up doing together. It was a kind of dramedy, and they parted ways from this film not really feeling any type of romantic sentiment for each other. And that's the amazing part. They actually didn't become a couple until 1936, and they married in 1939. They were married from 1939 to her death, uh, which I will delve into a little bit down the line. But I'd like to talk a little bit about the beginnings of Carol Lombard's life. She was born as Jane Alice Peters in Fort Wayne, Indiana. So she's a Hoosier, which really does contribute to her down-to-earth nature and her personality and everything like that because uh, my mom and her family, they're from Indiana. So I get I get what they say, her Hoosier fighting spirit. I, I understand what they say when um, biographers and, uh, you know, the media refer to her as that. Um, and she was born in a somewhat well-off family. Uh, her parents did separate in her childhood, and when that happened, her and her mother and her two brothers, Stuart and Frederick, they moved out to California, and although her parents did not formally divorce, um, they were separated. She never really saw her dad after that period, and the kind of interesting part is although she didn't really see her dad that much, he continued to financially support the family, so... Her, she spent um, a very, very, for the time, well-off childhood in California, and how she was discovered, it's so American. It's just utterly incredible. She was seen playing baseball in middle school, and the casting director saw her, and he saw this glamorous tomboy holding her own against all the boys and decided that they wanted to recruit her for bit roles in silent pictures. And she got her first role when she was about 12 years old. And it really just took off from there. She played, you know, bit parts, supporting roles, and silent pictures. And she was doing very, very well. Um, I can't really say anything about her silent pictures. I have not seen any of her silent pictures because they are very hard to get a hold of. Some of them are even lost, so I really can't vouch for her silent pictures. So I'm just going to leave it at that. But the one thing, as she was on the rise in, in silence, uh, when she was about 16, she suffered a major setback. She was in an automobile accident that severely damaged her face. And to continue on with her movie career, which she very much wanted to do at this point, although she was not a big star, she just loved doing what she was doing, she had to go through with 
er an early form of facial reconstruction surgery. And due to the misbelief at the time that if you received anesthetic, it would make the scars from the operation more permanent, which I don't know why they thought that. I have no idea, but that was the common belief at the time. And because of that, she had to endure that surgery without anesthetic. She had to just go through with it, all the pain, all of the ache. And she was a tough and true fighter. And she just came through it very beautifully. And the, although she did have a faint scar on her face for the rest of her career and essentially her life, she was able to diminish that mark with makeup and lighting techniques. And it served her very well throughout her career because nobody ever would say that she was an ugly woman or not beautiful in any shot that she did. So it just, that to me alone, just gives me the sense of who she was as a person and why she was just so wonderful. Just a portion, a small portion of why I think she's wonderful and why I hope I'm getting through to you that she was really wonderful. Anyway, um, after the ordeal with the plastic surgery, she returned to pictures and by now, you know, silence are on the way out, early sound films are on the way in. And she did move up the ranks from bit parts to playing like supporting roles, like the sister of a main character or, um, you know, the daughter of a main character, but not the main daughter, maybe like the other daughter. So she did films, early films in her career, like Fast and Loose, which she's not really the main leading lady in this picture. This is from 1930. She is kind of playing second fiddle to Miriam Hopkins, who has a bunch more screen time than her. I haven't even seen this film yet, but I just know for a fact, because I've read up on it, that she doesn't have a ton of screen time, but she is the scene stealer in that film, so that's kind of how she was moving up the ranks at this point. Um, this is kind of like a com early, early, what would be the beginning of a screwball comedy genre, but not really placeable in that type of genre. Um, she made movies around this period too, such as No Man of Her Own, I'm sorry, Man of the World. She made Man of the World with William Powell and this is how they met and they were married in 1931 which is when this film came out uh, and they would be married until 1933 although they would remain very very good friends for the rest of her life and I just find that incredible because they had such mutual respect for each other and they continued to keep each other in their lives. It's probably the classiest divorce you will ever hear about in the history of divorces. But, um, you know, making other films such as, you know, Supernatural 1933, which I kind of want to do a, a separate video on this movie just because of how surprised I was by how good it was. And again, in this movie, you know, she's playing, she is the leading lady, so she has worked her way up to Sorry, there was a really loud, long mower noise outside, and I really didn't want to have that in the video. But anyway, she... There it goes again. I'm just going to talk. Whatever. Um, she worked her way up to lead the leading lady, but again, she's not really... Well, no, I can't say that, but in this movie, she was the lead, yet... At the same time, it doesn't, the story doesn't really revolve completely around her, if that makes any sense. But, um, she's opposite Randolph Scott, and this movie just, again, it surprised me on how interesting and how good it was. I will do a separate video on this, but yeah, she's working her way through the ranks, but she hasn't found her groove yet, and this is 1933. For someone who's been acting since they were 12 years old in bit parts, at this point, you know, it, I think somebody would start to get irritated or annoyed by the fact she hasn't had a breakthrough yet and she never publicly complained about that she just wanted to work in pictures and just be happy to have a job and support her mom and be on set and just have fun with it and to me I think that's an utterly incredible attitude for that period of time especially in the early depression but um, her real breakthrough came in 1934 of a movie called 20th Century, directed by Howard Hawks, which I do not own, I cannot show you a picture of, 
But that movie was just really the precedent for what she would become most known for in her career. Um, and from then on, she was just America's favorite screwball comedy dame, becoming the highest paid actress of the 1930s. Of course, in 1932, she did the most important film, basically, the movie that we would be talking about many years later because it is Gable and Lombard. They met around the time of this movie in 1932. They're, they might have been introduced to each other at a Hollywood party around this time, but I think from what I've read, their first meeting was on the set of here. And when they did this movie, they had no romantic feelings for each other. They just did the job. Um, Clark Gable did not like Carol Lombard's free spirit and sailor mouth, which she was known for. She could swear like a man, but be glamorous at it. That is a trait that she basically invented, I think, but gets none of the credit for, but she basically invented it. And, um, Carol kind of thought Clark was stuff shirt and, uh, you know, very stiff, if you will. Um, and they really didn't hit it off again, that was 1932, until 1936 at a Hollywood party. They met again, and they didn't arrive with each other, but they definitely left with each other. <laughs> they played tennis. They were put up against each other at a tennis uh, match, round, whatever you want to call it, and they played until like four in the morning or something like that, and it just went from there. Um, and of course, at this point in 1936, Carol Lombard is divorced from William Powell, like I mentioned, although they are still good friends, and they make the movie My Man Godfrey together. In fact, Bill Powell refused to take the role um, if they couldn't secure Carol Lombard to play the role of Irene, and this this is just one of my personal favorite movies ever. It's William Powell being very sophisticated as a butler, just being, you know, a straight man. Or is he? <laughs> and that's just the brilliant part of this. And Carol Lombard playing the zany heiress who is just utterly delightful. She's insane, but delightful. And you just you wonder, how can I be fabulous like her? And this movie, if you don't know, is actually in the public domain, so if you want to find this movie and watch it, it is available on YouTube for free and it will never be deleted off the internet because uh, it's in the public domain. Um, however, it it's just one of my favorite movies, and the, the beauty part is you can look up the bloopers. There are surviving bloopers from this film, which is, again, utterly incredible because that is an extremely, extremely rare exception for a film from 1936, but I don't really want to spoil the plot of this film because then I would take away the joy from you watching it, which I hope I can convince somebody to watch this film. If I can convince one person to watch this film, then I'm doing a pretty good job. But um, seriously, this is one of her best roles, one of William Powell's best roles, and this movie made history at the Oscars by, although it did not win, it had Oscar noms for all four acting categories. Lead actor, lead actress, supporting actor, supporting actress. I consider it an essential and that's, I'm gonna leave it at that because if I continue on I'm gonna like blab about it, but um, you know, it's just amazingly brilliant. And around this time she also makes the movie <sighs> Nothing Sacred with Friedrich March and Walter Connolly, um, her only movie in color, and rumor has it that this was actually her favorite movie she was ever in. So for that reason, although this movie has received criticism for its zany and loony plot, unbelievable plot, I cannot criticize it because if it meant a lot to her, then it has to mean a lot to the audience. Um, Carol continued working steadily in screwball comedies throughout the 1930s, like the mid-1930s. Um, she made, uh, I'm sorry guys, I'm like digging for stuff. I have, in this box set contains some of her funniest films, like Princess Comes Across from 1936, Hands Across the Table from 1935, um, True Confession, and she did True Confession, Hands Across the Table, and the movie Princess Comes Across with Fred... McMurray, 
course from my three sons and Fred McMurray and her they're just utterly delightful as well and they're just they're just delightful films I don't want to spoil too much about them but because you can look up the films on your own time if you want but they're just utterly utterly delightful and wonderful but around 1938 she starts to have a a dip she made the movie um fools for scandal and it was a major flop it was all this hype and it wasn't a very good film i have not seen it i can't vouch or not vouch for it but i um by all accounts it was one of the greatest flops of the decade of not only screwball comedies in general but of the decade overall um she really was set back by that and around this time she started to change her image maybe the comedy was wearing thin the comedy routine was wearing thin so she then makes um two incredible dramas from this time that although they did not do very well at the time of release you watch them today and it really proves what kind of an actress that she was in the range that she was capable of uh, in 1939, she made Made for Each Other with Jimmy Stewart, one of Jimmy Stewart's first roles as a leading man, not supporting player. Utterly incredible. It It's emotional, and although some people might say it's a little too dramatic, I, I don't think so at all, because Carol really worked so, so hard on this movie. And she made the movie as well in name only alongside Cary Grant and Kay Francis. Um, this movie is very interesting because it paralleled her real life experiences of a man being trapped in a loveless marriage who will not consent to divorce although she is in love and he's in love. Um, they're mutually in love with each other. Um, uh, Carol plays the lovable one and Kay Francis plays the horrible wife um and this paralleled her real life experience of clark gable and his struggle to get divorced from Rhea langham whom of which never even loved clark gable um and if you don't believe clark gable was not a romantic he said he wasn't really a romantic he did the movie gone with the wind to get the salary to divorce Rhea langham so he could marry carol lombard if that isn't a romantic gesture, I don't know what is. Really, Clark, you were secretly a romantic. Don't deny it. We love you for it today. <laughs> but, um, because as soon as he got divorced, the first day he could get off from filming Gone with the Wind, he used it to elope with Carol Lombard. And that was in 1939 as well. So at 1939, although Carol's career was kind of at a standpoint and she was trying to uh, redefine her image, um, personally, in her personal life, she was on top of the world because she had just gotten married to Clark Gable and they had fought so hard and so long to be with each other that you just can't help but smile that they eventually did get together. And everything, um, goes well into early 1940. Um, she made a movie called Vigil in the Night, which personally I don't care for it. It's directed by George Stevens, one of his early drama films. I, I personally don't care for it. I only saw it once. Maybe if I saw it today I'd have something different to say about it because I was very young when I watched that film. But uh, personally I, I don't really care for it. Um, and then she made a movie called They Know What We Wanted and that was I believe her return to comedy after accepting that her drama films did not do very well. That's not my opinion that just what was happening at the time and um her second to last film she did was for Hitchcock in the film Mr. and Mrs. Smith where um this couple they've been married and their marriage is kind of on the rocks but then they discover that they're not actually legally married and do they want to stay together and get legally married or do they want to actually break up it's a typical Hitchcock but it has that sense of humor that Hitch was always known for and Carol was absolutely delightful in it. R rumor has it that Hitchcock only directed this film as a favor to Carol Lombard. So but I, I this movie receives a lot of criticism but I don't have a bad thing to say about it. 
And then she makes a movie in 1942 called To Be or Not To Be, and this was her final film appearance on screen and one of her favorite film experiences on set that she participated in. And unfortunately, this came out shortly after she passed away. Um, she ultimately, oh God, um, Carol wanted to do her bit to support war bonds and show support for the country's entrance into World War II. So she went on this war bond tour across the country, ultimately ending the tour in Indianapolis. Um, uh, Clark Gable did not go with her. Uh, he had to work on a film called Somewhere I'll Find You. Um, she wanted to get back to him because she had an inkling that he was going to have an affair with Lana Turner. Ultimately, she had a toying toss, toying, coin, sorry, coin toss with her mom, who was with her, uh, as was Clark Gable's press agent, Otto Winkler, who was a good friend to them both. And she won the coin toss, agreeing that they would take a plane rather than the train, although her mother was very, very superstitious about it. She sensed something bad would happen. Uh, they got on the plane, and ultimately it crashed uh, in Arizona, and everybody on board was killed. Her mom, her, the press agent, Otto Winkler, the pilot, co-pilot, everybody on board crashed, and it was just one of the most devastating deaths of an American actress, I think, b beloved American actress, I think, ever to occur. And Clark Gable, of course, devastated. He had to not only claim the body of his wife, but his mother-in-law and his press agent, who also happened to be his best friend. And he utterly became a changed man after that. He buried his grief in the army, which turned out to be Carol's dying wish that he enlist in World War II. Um, uh, he, the, everybody who knew Clark Gable said that he lost the sparkle in his eye and the true boyish smile on his face. And although he continued to act till the end of his life in 1961, yeah, 61, I believe. Yeah, because, yeah, 1961. Sorry, I, so this is just pretty heavy to talk about. It's emotional. Um, and he married twice more. He never was the same man. In fact, he had to be restrained from go searching on the crash site. And he was brought back a... Somebody who did survey the crash site to look for survivors brought Clark Gable back a ruby clip and a lock of her hair and he kept that in a locket around his neck for the rest of his life. Utterly devastating for Clark Gable because the ladies man of Hollywood finally finds the true woman he loves and loses her. It it just it, it's so sad. Um but utterly Carol Lombard left behind a legacy of not only the films, but also she was declared to be the first victim, civilian victim of World War II by the president. So, utterly, I find it very, very sad that her legacy is not well known by people my age. And I'd like to be a spokesperson by saying that some people around my age do find her to be fascinating, interesting, and amazing. And I just have the most, the utmost respect for this person and what she did for American cinema and for history overall. I, I wish more people could have her fighting spirit and that 
that that's that's it that that's basically what i have to say about her um if you enjoyed this video and you want to see me highlight a film of hers whether it be like mr and mrs smith or no, in name only or made for each other or nothing sacred or any any of these movies that i have of carol's please let me know in the comments below and i thank you so much for watching this video i am sorry if it got kind of spotty in some areas with me like not being able to speak but i guess that's just i've, I've never talked about this openly with like people i've always I, I'll, I'll read about it and everything but i guess discussing it makes me more just it, it just gets to me you know but anyway i'm emily graziano thank you for watching this video and i will see you in the next one thank you and bye-bye